A verse uh, that many of us have memorized uh, is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, maybe even chapter, verse 9. I'm going to read it because when I try to quote things from memory up here, I forget the words and then I feel silly. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, so that, uh, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. How many people have memorized that verse sometime in your life? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, so that we cannot boast. And this is the great truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is, he saves us even without merit. We don't deserve it. We don't earn it. Jesus died for us that we might receive forgiveness of sins merely by trusting him. We trust him and he saves us. But oftentimes we forget to read that verse 10. I read it. I included it. I'm going to read it again. Ephesians 2.10. Are you listening? We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has, in fact, created us to do what? Good works. This is not rocket science, although his good work he has for you might be rocket science. I don't know. He has created us for good works. He did not save us to get to heaven and sit and soak till heaven showed up. He saved us to the glory of the fellowship of Christ that we might serve him until that glory shows up. We are created to do good works. We're created to serve. In fact, we're created in Christ to have a life of service. It's very popular in our culture today, the a notion of volunteerism and community engagement and involvement. A number of major volunteer organizations listed the major benefits of volunteering and serving. In fact, they listed them on their websites. I'm going to read a couple of them. You want to hear some of the benefits to serving, benefits of volunteering. Aren't you excited? I can just tell. A number of you moved to the edge of your seat and got your pen out. Okay. One of the good reasons to volunteer gets you out of the house. Maybe you've got cabin fever from the winter. Volunteering can get you out of the house. Volunteering can be fun. Entertain. It can be an enjoyable experience to volunteer somewhere where you enjoy yourself. By volunteering and serving, you can make new friends. Some of you are looking to trade up in the friend department. Volunteering and ser serving others can be inspiring. It can inspire you to new perspectives and new viewpoints on the world around you. In serving others and volunteering, you can find your purpose. You've got to spell that correctly. You don't want to find your purpose. Volunteering can help strengthen your resume. If you're a college student or a high school student, you can volunteer to help get you into the school of your dreams. Uh, Volunteering and serving others, you can engage in meaningful conversations. Maybe the conversations you're currently having are dull, and you want to converse with people who have shared interests with you. So volunteer in a place where you can have those exciting and intellectually stimulating conversations. Volunteering can make you feel good about yourself. Volunteering, in fact, a new study has just come out, is very good for your health. You can use your skills productively, or in volunteering, you can develop new skills. You can meet new people. You can explore areas of interest. You can make connections and have a connection in the community around you that right now maybe you don't feel as connected. As one website said, volunteering and doing so, you can volunteer and impress your mom. Perhaps your mom up to this point in your life has been disappointed Apparently, volunteering will fix all of those problems. A life of service. I want to talk this morning through the life and, and narrative of uh, Ruth and Boaz, what the Bible tells us about a life of service. And I want to tell you right up front that the biblical uh, understanding of a life of service, the, uh, a God-oriented life of service is counter cultural. A life of service understood from the scripture is a life of service that is not like our culture. And by our culture, I'm not saying them versus us. We are our culture as well. If you want to get away from your culture, you're going to have to get away from you. 
So when I talk, I want us to understand when I use the term our culture, I'm not saying them, I'm saying us. A life of service as, in, as uh, understood in the scripture is counter cultural. And let me illustrate this with a couple of statistics which are available on several government websites. Now I can't read my handwriting, which is a problem, but that's okay. The average person volunteers 50 hours a year. 50 hours a year. That seems like a pretty good uh, stint, doesn't it? Seems like a lot. Uh, that's an hour a week. That's a lot of time. But I don't know if you knew this. 23% of the people in our country volunteer. So when we say people volunteer an hour a week, that's 23%. 77% of our country volunteer zero hours a year. So we would say, if you might say, well, the country, the United States is a country of volunteerism, the answer is what? No. 23% of our country is a country of volunteerism. 77% of our country does no volunteering or donating of their time during the year. So let's look even a little closer, and I know stats are exciting. I can see you drifting off into Never Never Land. We donate an hour a year. The 23% of us that volunteer in some capacity throughout the year give an hour a week, 50-some hours a year. Our leisure time, time where we get to decide what to do that doesn't impact our ability to survive, is four and a half hours a day. So every week we give one hour of the four hours a day that we have available. Four times seven is what? 28? So every week we have half a work week available, and I'm not saying we should volunteer every moment of our leisure time, but let's just be clear. Those of us who are volunteering are volunteering one hour a week out of four hours a day that we have available. Most of us are watching two to two and a half hours of television a day, which is fine if it's good uh, programming, like cooking shows. I love the cooking shows. I don't know why. So that's volunteer. We give one hour of our leisure time uh, a year. Now let's talk about how we donate and why do we have to indicate this? Because we can say this, listen, we're Americans. We live in a fluent culture. Thank the Lord we get to enjoy many of uh, luxuries of life that most of the world doesn't get to live with. I enjoy air conditioning. I enjoy a water running water in several rooms in my home. I like the fact that I can go from an air-conditioned house to an air-conditioned car to an air-conditioned store. I mean, isn't that fantastic? It's amazing. I mean, some of us even cool the car off before we go out there. Who does that? It's cool, and so you go turn the car on so it's cool when you get into it. It's not all, all hot. So we enjoy the luxury. So what we say is because we are affluent, we don't have to donate our time. We donate our funds so that others can be engaged in service. And I don't have a problem with that, but let's just look again at the statistics. We give 6%, not of our income. Are you ready? We give 6% of our discretionary income. What's discretionary income? What's discretionary money? The money we can do with whatever we want and our lifestyle is not affected. It's our cable bill, it's our movies, it's our vacations, it's our uh, recreation time, it's uh, the grill out back, whatever it is, discretionary income, that if all of that income were to gone, you would still survive. As Americans, we give 6% of our discretionary income. So 94% of the money that we have to blow whatever we want with, we keep. And we donate to uh, important causes, 6%. Now, I guess, thankfully, we are extraordinarily affluent. Praise the Lord again for that. And so that's a significant chunk of money. In fact, it's more money than many countries. Uh, but the fact is, on, on, uh, across the board, we volunteer very little time, nor do we give uh, significantly to uh, pay that, so that others will volunteer their time. Here's our cultural mandate. Here's the cultural truth. How do we reach and volunteer in our communities around us? We do it a lot as long as it doesn't change my life. So that's the American notion of volunteerism and engagement. So again, I don't want to, I'm not being accusatory, I'm just stating information that I've, I've gathered. Uh, so you understand, I'm not saying uh, that going on vacation is bad. We haven't said any of that. That's later in the message. We haven't got there yet. <laughs> and we're not even going to say that. 
What I want us to understand when we talk about a life of service, why do I bring this up? Because the Bible talks about service differently than our culture talks about service. So as Americans, if we come to the Bible and say, I want to think about what it means to have a life of service, we immediately have to acknowledge it talks about it differently than we normally think. If we don't do that, we'll miss what the Bible is actually saying. Because what the Bible actually says about service uh, rattles our cage quite a bit. So if you go to the Bible and say, what does it mean to serve God? If it doesn't rattle your cage, go read it again. You read it wrong. Because the way the Bible talks about service is countercultural. Service in the Bible is not another way for me to engage in fun or to receive a pleasure in my own life or a, li a volunteerism in the Bible or service in the Bible is not a means to my own self-fulfillment. Did you notice all those reasons to volunteer that I read earlier? They all had to do with benefits to the one serving. I don't know if you noticed that. In the Bible, it's countercultural because service is not another place for me to gain fulfillment. It's not another place for me to gain pleasure or another place to gain fun. Service in the Bible includes all of those things, but not as the primary reason for serving, but as a secondary benefit. We call it blessing. That when we serve others, we enjoy it. But that's not the primary re reason we serve. And I want to use uh, and understand the, the life of Ruth and Boaz to see what the Bible has to say about a life of service. Now, many of you would be leaving now, except for the pulled pork sandwiches. That's not accidental. If you want to turn back to chapter 1, we're not going to read it, but we're going to kind of give a little review of the life of Ruth. A life of service. First of all, we're going to look at Ruth serves Naomi. Ruth serves Naomi. So Naomi was a woman living in Israel. She was married uh, to her husband, and both of them were Israelites, and they had two sons. Famine hit Israel, and Naomi and her husband and her two sons moved from Israel to Moab. So they moved to Moab to find food because there's no food in Israel. There's a significant famine. While Naomi and her husband are living in Moab, their two sons marry two Moabite women. Orpah, not Oprah, you've got to say it right. Orpah and Ruth. And whenever we say Ruth and Ruth, what are we supposed to do? Oh, we just love Ruth, don't we? Okay, maybe not. All right. Orpah and Ruth. What happens? Ten years they live in Moab. Naomi and her husband, Ruth and her husband, and Orpah and her husband. And over the course of a decade, all three of their husbands die. Naomi's husband dies. Ruth's husband dies. Orpah's husband dies. None of uh, Ruth and her sister-in-law Orpah did not have any children with their husbands. Word makes its way back to Naomi that food is once again in supply in Israel. And so Naomi says to her daughters-in-law, I'm going to return to Israel. Food is there. God is blessing once again. And she encourages them to stay in Moab. She says to Ruth and Orpah, stay here. Find a husband. Get married. Rest in your new home. And she implores them several times. Finally, her one daughter-in-law, Orpah, says, okay, I'll stay. And she stays in Moab, but Ruth will not leave Naomi. And Ruth says this in verse 16 of Ruth chapter 1. It's a famous verse. It's worth reading, Ruth 1.16. Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Ruth is going to stay with Naomi. Ruth is going to stay with Naomi at her own peril. She is taking her life into her hands to stay with Naomi. She is uh, taking a significant risk that she might journey with and be bound to Naomi and her people and Naomi and her God. What Ruth is saying to Naomi here is, my rest will be in your people, my rest will be in your God. Back in verse 9 of Ruth, Naomi had told Ruth to find her rest where? 
with a new husband. And Ruth is saying, Naomi, I will not seek rest with a new husband. I will seek rest with your God. I might suggest that Ruth might be saying two things. First of all, though, my experience with the husband department is lacking. Certainly, I might find a husband, and we might find some sense of rest, but a husband is not permanent. Her own experience would tell her that, that the Bible gives no negative impact from a Ruth's husband, doesn't say anything terribly negative about these three men, other than the fact that they left Israel. But the fact is, a husband is immortal. I mean, amortal, not immortal. He is one who dies at some point. And she is saying, Naomi, there is only some sense of rest, maybe, in a family. All of that is temporal. If I want permanent rest, I will find it only in your people and your God. That is where I will seek rest. So we need to understand something important about Ruth at this point. At some point in her life, in knowing Naomi, she trusted in God. She wouldn't make this statement if at some level she didn't trust in the God that Naomi trusted in. Here's what she has observed so far. Three men left Israel in a famine to come to Moab. How did that work out for them? Maybe running from God in his place to find their own solution wasn't such a good idea. Maybe staying in God in his place in spite of what is going on there, is the better idea. So Ruth understood that them coming to Moab was no help to them, was it? They're dead. Secondly, she knows through Naomi at this point that God is once again providing for the people of Israel. So she says leaving the people of Israel to come to Moab was no help for Naomi's husband or sons. Secondly, the place of God's provision and God's rest is God's land. And so even if it is such a basic understanding, Ruth understood that God's place was the place of provision and rest. And she trusted God enough to say, I want to go with Naomi back to the place where God is working and where God's people are. Naomi's husbands and sons left the place of God's provision. The land of God is better in famine than the land without God in a time of plenty. And Ruth understood this, understood this. So even though she knew very little about God, she trusted God. So Ruth served Naomi. And the question we have to ask about why we might serve, there's two questions really. One is, why should we serve? And how should we serve? So why did Ruth serve Naomi? Let me just give one reason. There's probably many, but let me give one. She had faith in God. She trusted God in spite of the fact that she didn't know that much about God. But what she did know was that God could be trusted. She trusted that God could provide, and she trusted that God could provide for even two single women traveling from Moab to Israel. She trusted God, and she said, uh, Naomi, I trust your God enough that I want your people to be my people, your God to be my God. And she even says this, where you die, I will die. Ruth trusted God so much, she said, listen, Naomi, if God has it in the cards that we buy it today, I want to make sure we're buried together. That's how much I trust in your God, that he will not separate us, that even if he is calling for our death, I still trust him even in that. Boaz made this comment about Ruth down in verse 12 of chapter 2. This is what helps us understand Ruth's perspective. Later on, Boaz uh, describes what he has observed in Ruth, and this is what he says. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, this is the important part, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So when Naomi and Ruth departed Moab, it wasn't Ruth just taking the best of all of her bad options. What we're discovering about Ruth is she was staying with Naomi to go to the land of Israel because she said, I will take refuge in God. I want to be under the wings of this God. He is a good God, and I want him to take my refuge in the, under the wings and under the shelter of God. She took refuge in God, and she trusted in God. Why did Ruth serve Naomi? 
to gain new perspective, to be inspired, to build community. She served, Ruth served Naomi, she said, because I trust your God. I trust the God who you follow. And remember, Ruth couldn't have outlined any kind of theology of God. Because Ruth, tell us everything you know about God. I can trust him. Well, what else do you know? You know, that's kind of all I got so far, so I'm going to roll with that. I mean, isn't that funny? We spend all of our Christian life wrestling with theological issues to figure out if we can trust the guy. And Ruth basically knows ten words about God. He can be trusted. That's not ten words, but you know what I mean. In the Hebrew, it's ten words. I don't know Hebrew. She took refuge in God, and so she serves Ruth because she trusts this God. She trusted him. So they show up in Israel, Naomi and Ruth. Naomi retells her story to all of the people in Israel. She says, no longer call me Naomi, Naomi says. She says, call me bitterness because my life is bitter. Ruth then goes to glean. They arrive during the barley harvest, which is a perfect time to arrive because barley is the first harvest. There will be the barley harvest and then the wheat harvest. So she'll be able to glean for a longer period of time by arriving during this time of year. Of course, the year earlier, it wouldn't have mattered. There was a famine. There would have been nothing to glean. So Ruth was poor, and she was a foreigner in Israel. And that's okay, though, because in Israel, in the law, in the Mosaic law code, in Leviticus 23.22, this is what we read about living in the land of Israel as an impoverished foreigner. When you reap the harvest of your land... Do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings. Leave them for the who? Poor and for the foreigner residing among you. In case you don't know if I'm serious, he says this, I am the Lord your God. So Ruth is going to go out and she's going to glean, knowing that the Mosaic law code, the covenant law code, as Naomi probably described on the way there, says that she can go into the field even as a poor foreigner and pick up what was left behind. She can glean. God has specifically designed a system in the covenant with his people to make sure the poor and the foreigner are cared for. So she makes her way to a field and she begins gleaning and she is, she is noticed by Boaz. Boaz shows up at work. He's Mr. Happy, Happy, Joy, Joy. Blessing in the Lord. Everybody loves that guy at work. You're sitting there trying to work, and somebody comes skipping in. Sit down. Leave us alone. And then he says, who's this lady? And they say, that is the, the woman, uh, Ruth, who has come back with Naomi. And, Ruth, and, and they describe to him the fact that she has been working hard and she has been gleaning all day uh, other than a short break under the shelter. And uh, Boaz instantly notices the fact that he is attracted to her as well as the fact that she is seeking to serve her mother-in-law. And so Boaz gave her good treatment. He went up to her and said, do not go to any other fields because in other fields you may be mis mistreated. And he says, in fact, go over if you need a drink of water, go over and you can get, use water out of the water jugs. I want you to have safety. I want you to have water. And in fact, he even invited her to lunch. We read about that when we did our, our reading earlier. He gave her some bread. He gave her some wine vinegar. He gave her some roasted grain, and she ate so much that she had leftovers. She went out and gleaned in the field uh, more after lunch, and it says that she collected an ephah, that is about 30 to 40 pounds of barley grain after she had threshed it. That's a pretty good return on gleanings. Boaz here, we understand, in operating his field is providing to uh, Ruth, I should say, uh, after God's provision indicates. Boaz is one who knows the covenant of God and is seeking to operate consistent with the covenant of God. He did not exclude Ruth the Moabite. He did not have her mistreated. We read this down in verse 18 of Ruth chapter 2. Ruth carried everything back to town, showed her mother-in-law everything she had gathered, which was an enormous amount, and she also gave her mother-in-law dinner from her leftovers from lunch. 
She gave, them, uh, gave everything to, to, Naomi, to Naomi even after she herself had been satisfied. She had how much? She had more than she needed. Ruth served. Why did we indicate that Ruth is serving Naomi? Because she had faith in God. The second question we have to ask about serving is how does Ruth serve? Ruth is serving at her own peril. She is serving in fields where harm could occur to her. She is serving in places where she may not collect enough food to be able to, to, to even eat. She is serving at her own peril, knowing that God will provide enough and God will provide the safety she needs or that he deems fit for her. She is serving because she trusts God and because she trusts God, she can serve at her own peril, putting her own safety at risk, putting her own health at risk, even putting her own appetite at risk. And God provided enough for her to eat and be satisfied and even for Naomi to eat and be satisfied and not merely grain, roasted grain, prepared the way Boaz liked it prepared. Why did Ruth serve? Because she trusted God. How did she serve? At her own peril, assuming God would give enough. And God gave enough, didn't he? Did they have enough? We have to understand what that word means before we move on to Boaz. What does it mean to have enough? I'm going to label it this way. If you like this term, you can write it down. If you don't like it, you can mock me silently. I call it the manna principle. The manna principle. What is enough? Enough is enough for today. See, Ruth had gathered 30 pounds of grain. That's a lot of grain for someone gleaning. But that doesn't last forever. God hadn't provided her the eternal pot of barley grain. That as long as she scooped it out of it, grain would just keep coming forever. God had provided her and Naomi enough food for maybe a week or two. Now, at some point, that 30 pounds of grain isn't going to be 10 pounds of grain. And at some point, that 10 pounds of grain is going to be 5 pounds of grain. So how much grain do you have to have to say that's enough grain? After gleaning for a day, Naomi and Ruth said, we have enough. We have enough for today, so therefore we have enough. Enough is not security. Enough is not a long-term plan. Enough is not security that I will be able to live all my days exactly as I might want to intend to live. The man of principle of enough says, God has provided for today, and that is enough. This is why Ruth was able to serve Naomi and she was able to give her roasted grain to her mother-in-law when she got back. Do you think she thought in the back of her head, that roasted grain will be good tomorrow at lunch? I mean, if she didn't, I don't know what was wrong with her. I'll give her a little bit. You know, she gave her the roasted grain because she had enough. She was fine. Uh, she didn't have security. She didn't know what tomorrow held, but she had enough for today. And so therefore, she was able to serve at her peril because she knew God would give enough. We have to understand that God giving enough is a whole lot different than God giving what we want. In fact, I might suggest that what we want is never just enough. Reading through Scripture, what we want is enough that we don't need God. Nothing is so irritating about the Christian life as the fact that every day you have to need God, isn't it? It's almost like he makes our life such that we wake up every day needing him. And the one thing our heart craves for is to have enough to not need him anymore. The worst thing you could ever get is enough to not need him anymore. This is what Jesus talks about in the New Testament when he says, it is difficult for those of us who are rich, which includes anybody that calls, calls the United States their home, it's very difficult to get into the kingdom of God. Why? Because we have so much, we don't need God the way Ruth and Naomi did. So two barriers to serving before we move on to Boaz. Why did Ruth serve Naomi? Because she trusted God. So one of the barriers to serving God in our life is the fact that in our heart and mind, even though we may not say it out loud, God isn't trustworthy. Something has occurred in our life and we have decided God is an ogre. That he likes to make our life difficult and he thinks it's funny. 
God is a cheapskate. And so God is not trustworthy. It is almost impossible to serve God and others if he's not trustworthy. If we don't have an, a sense of understanding that God is trustable. I don't even, is that a word? It is now. And by trustworthy, I don't mean uh, aloof and far off, oh, I can trust him, but his opinion on matters is different than mine. Trustworthy meaning I trust his judgment and his insight. He knows better than me what is needed here. I trust him more than I trust my own judgment. So one of the barriers to serving is in our hearts and minds we have a problem in that we think God is not trustworthy. The other, other barrier to serving we have is this. What does tomorrow hold? Anybody know what tomorrow holds? Is there a prophet or son of a prophet? Anyone? So why did we come in here so worried about it? Isn't that funny? I mean, you're going to act like it wasn't you. It's everybody else sitting around you. You walked in here bound up about tomorrow. I mean, we are bound up. And none of us have any idea what it holds. That's what's funny. And, and the problem is, as long as we are afraid of what tomorrow holds, we will never be able to rest in what God is doing today and, and release ourselves to serve him and to serve others. Ruth got to the point where she said, God's got tomorrow. I'll just glean today. And that 30-pound bag of grain, we'll eat through it and see what comes tomorrow. Two major barriers we're going to have to serving God and serving others is God isn't trustworthy, and we don't know what tomorrow holds. And it's these two major barriers which leads to the statistics I mentioned earlier, where we give one hour a week because we need to make sure we have lots of margin because we don't know if tomorrow is going to have the rest we want or need. And we don't give uh, money and support uh, important causes that might actually resonate with us because we don't want know what tomorrow holds. What if I donate money to that important cause and, and tomorrow I need the money? So because God isn't trustworthy and I don't know what tomorrow holds, I hold on to my time and I hold on to my money. And Ruth showed us, why do we serve God? Because God is trustworthy and we can even serve him at our peril. Because God is enough. Okay, let's look at Bo Boaz. I almost said Boaz. That's the Canadian pronunciation, Boaz. <laughs> Boaz serves Ruth. Now, Boaz, of course, let's uh, understand, he is a man. He is single. He sees Ruth, and she is smoking hot. And he is attracted to her. But it's not merely her physical form that he is attracted to, uh, but certainly he is that. But Boaz sees in Ruth, Boaz serves Ruth, and Boaz sees in Ruth an obedience, in fact, to the covenant that God has with his people, even though she doesn't know the details of that covenant. Let me, let me help you understand. In Jeremiah 31, 33, we read this uh, from the prophet. Of course, we know Jeremiah comes long after this, but the principle is the same. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Did you hear that last sentence? Or have we heard that before? Sounds very Ruthian. You will, they, they will be my people, and he will be my God. And God is here promising the people of Israel that there will be a new covenant that is to come, and he will write the, his law on their hearts and minds, meaning it won't merely be a law, law code to be obeyed. You will be moved by God to do things his way. And Boaz sees Ruth, who doesn't know the covenant law code, acting towards Naomi the way somebody would if that covenant law code was written on their heart. We understand this is important to Boaz because this is the way Boaz operates. Does Boaz obey the law? It appears he's seeking to. We know from the New Testament, nobody can obey the law. The law is intended to merely illustrate to us we can't obey it. But he is one who loves God, and he is seeking to obey the law in the operation of his field. Leviticus tells us he is supposed to not uh, reap all the way to the edges, and he is supposed to leave grain behind, and he's to do that for the impoverished and the foreigner. Notice when Boaz gave instructions to allow Ruth to have greater access to grain, none of his workers argued with him. Why? Because this was not unusual. If this was Boaz the ogre, someone would have noted, well, Boaz, she must be hot. 
But nobody did because this is not out of character for Boaz. We're going to discover this in the rest of the book of Ruth. This is not out of line with Boaz's character. He is one who loves God and wants to obey the law of God, but not merely the written code. He is not saying, he's not going to his uh, synagogue leader or his priest saying, now it says not to go to the edges. So how far exactly is that? And then he's got his workers out there measuring it. Make sure it's not any closer. That's what the priest says. He's going to fudge on the inside. Leave too much just in case. And let, him, let them take too much because we want to help the impoverished. Boaz understands the true law in Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19 that Jesus quotes when asked about it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. When Jesus was asked, who is my neighbor, if Boaz would have been standing with Jesus, Boaz would have said, I know the answer to that one. It's the Moabite who's got nothing, is my neighbor. Why did Boaz serve Ruth? Because he had trust in God. But unlike Ruth, Ruth who had trust in God she knew very little about, Boaz had a trust in God that he knew. Boaz had seen what God is like as redeemer in his covenant with his people, and Boaz knew what God's redeeming love was like both in his covenant and in his life. And Boaz says, I know what God is like, and I want to be like that, and I trust him. He's a good God, and I want to be like that God, and I trust him. When the foreigner and the impoverished come to my field, they are going to leave with a full belly. Ruth trusted the God she didn't know, and she said, even death won't separate us, Naomi. Boaz had a faith in God that he knew, and even a lack of food wouldn't keep him from God's ways. Why do I say that? What has Israel just come out of? And we know this from the beginning of the book of Ruth. Famine. What does Boaz's barns look like instead of doing this harvest? Empty. We tend to think he's giving out of this surplus. And of course, he's a wealthy man. He does have land. But the fact is, he's coming out of a famine. And all of us, business people or workers alike, when the bank account's empty, what's job number one? Get the emergency fund funded. Get the six months of income squared away. Get the 401k back in line. And now we can finally get about the business of helping God's people. Boaz doesn't do any of that. He doesn't know if this is going to be just one good year or ten good years. It doesn't matter. He's got a field full of grain, and the impoverished Moabite woman has free access to it. See, this is Boaz trusting in God, that God is the one going to provide the grain. He did so when he was in a famine, and he's going to do that even though he's having a bumper crop. Because he trusted God, he could resist the temptation to store up and he could worship God by keeping the Mosaic Covenant, not merely by keeping the minimums of it, but by letting the truth of who God is in the Mosaic Covenant flow from his heart. See, God is one who gives and helps. And he saw this in Ruth. Why did Boaz serve Ruth? Because he trusted God. He trusted the God he knew. He trusted God even though they were just recovering from famine. How did Boaz serve? Same way Ruth did. He imperils himself. He discovers that he is a kinsman redeemer. We're going to skip chapter 3 of Ruth. Oh, that's the romantic bit. We just don't have time for it. You can read it at home. Husbands, gold star if you read chapter 3 of Ruth to your wife this afternoon. Yeah, you're welcome. He imperils himself, so he's a kinsman redeemer. What does that mean? Uh, Naomi's husband is dead, and his family line will end because his land is connected to his name. And the Mosaic Covenant said if a man dies without children, uh, the next closest relative is to marry his wife, if he is available, redeem his land, and perpetuate his name. This was important as a part of the Mosaic Covenant. There's reasons to it related to the gospel, but we don't have time for it today. And Boaz was the, a redeemer. He could buy uh, Naomi's land and marry Ruth, and the children that Boaz and Ruth would had, 
uh, at least the first child at a minimum, would be accounted to Naomi's husband so that his line could be perpetuated, that his name would not vanish from the earth. And he agrees, I'm going to redeem you, Ruth. I'm going to buy the land and I'm going to marry you. However, there's another relative who has right of first refusal. So he goes to the city gate the next day and that's where they did all of their real estate business. And the elders were there and they were going to be witnesses. And he calls this fellow over. We don't know his name. And Boaz says to him, hey, listen, Naomi's got some land. You ought to buy it. You're the redeemer and you can buy the land. And the guy goes, that's awesome. God is blessing the land, more barley for me. And then Boaz throws this in. This is not Boaz's first business negotiation, obviously. Oh, and by the way, you got to marry Ruth. I'm sorry, what? The impoverished Moabite, she's kind of part of the deal. Oh, I can't do that. That's what the guy said. No, I can't do that because that will imperil my inheritance. What happens if he marries her and she doesn't have children or she only has one child? That child will be accounted to Naomi's husband, Elimelech, and all of his, all of his land will now go from his name into Elimelech's name. He said, I'm not going to risk my name and my property for some Moabite widow who frankly was married for 10 years and wasn't real good on the having kid department. I mean, what's this like for Ruth? She wasn't able to have children, and, and she's a Moabite, and she's impoverished. Who would marry her? Because she is a risk. And Mo, Boaz says, you're not going to? And, and the guy says, no, you buy it. And Mo, what does Boaz say? Well, I, didn't, I hadn't thought about those issues. Hmm. I'll marry her. And Boaz does it. They trade sandals right there. I don't get it. Yeah, next time you're at the title company, try that. But the real estate agent, see what, see what happens. Might not, might be an interesting closing. <laughs> Boaz imperils his own inheritance, that he is unconcerned. There's two things going for Boaz here that we know that is imperiling his own inheritance. Number one, Ruth had been married 10 years and had not had a child. Number two, we know from Boaz's response to Ruth in chapter 3, Boaz is not a young guy. In fact, he says to Ruth, why would you pursue me when there are younger men? So we've got old man Boaz and Ruth, who has not been able to have children. They're going to get married to perpetuate an inheritance? Boaz, I don't know what, what your risk assessment officer said about this. This is not a good deal. Boaz serves Ru Ruth to, even at his own peril. In doing so, he is assuming God will provide a son. Boaz, in serving Ruth, says, my name means nothing. I don't care about my name. I don't care my, about my inheritance. Now, interestingly, how many children of Ruth and Boaz are recorded in the Bible? Just one. Now, if the author of Ruth wanted to make us all feel better that Boaz had not taken an unnecessary risk, they would have said, uh, Ruth and Boaz had Obed, he's the important one, oh, and he had a bunch of others, so don't worry about it, everything worked out. But it didn't say that. Ruth and Boaz had Obed, and likely all of Boaz's inheritance would have gone to the name of Elimelech, Obed. And who was Obed's great-grandson? King David. So Boaz lost his name and gained a better one. He imperiled himself because he loved God and because he trusted God. And in the end, he lost what many people would have spent their whole lives protecting. And the end result was he gained a better name. He gained the, na gained the name great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather to King David, father of the Messiah. I think Boaz did okay. But he had faith in God he knew, and he trusted God to the point where he would imperil himself. Why do we serve? Because we trust God. How do we serve? At our own peril. R Ruth did this by trusting in God. She trusted that God would give enough, and God gave enough. Not a lot when she was with Naomi, but enough. Boaz served Ruth. Why? Because he trusted the God he knew 
And he did so how? At his own peril, that God would give him a son, and God, in fact, did. Now let's look at Boaz, long coming Messiah son. If you look in Matthew chapter 1, you'll see the genealogy that goes from Boaz all the way through Christ. Jesus serves. Why? He knows the Father. He trusts the Father. How did he serve? Did he serve at his own peril? I don't think you sweat drops of blood in a garden if you're not in peril. He gave himself. Jesus serves the Father, and Jesus, in fact, serves us by making himself available to die the death we should have died and to be raised from the grave that we might have eternal life by trusting in him. This is how Jesus serves. He knows and trusts the Father, and he serves at his own peril. He gives himself for people like us who don't deserve it. He is the one Son. He gives us eternal life. He gives us inheritance in the kingdom of God. He gives us an opportunity to be raised with Him and to live forever. What we believe about what God does and what we believe about what Jesus did for us and what we believe about what God is like will move us to practice service. Our possessions or our time will never move us to serve. This is countercultural. Our culture tells us we will serve others when we have enough time and money. Jesus says you will serve others when you understand and believe what is true about what God is like and how God works, regardless of how much time or money you have. Let me repeat that just so you understand and in case somebody didn't hear it and missed the chance to be offended. Our culture tells us we will serve when we have enough, what? Time and money. And by culture, we mean us in the room, don't we? I mean, how many of us is, I'd love to do it, but you know, I just, oh, I'm swamped. I'd love to, I'd love to help, but I just, I, you know, you just don't have it. Our possessions will not move us to practice we will not serve when we have enough time and money. We will serve when we trust who God is and what God is doing. This is what Jesus is like. When Boaz looked at the law, he said, oh man, that's a good God. I want to be like that guy. When we look at Christ, we should be so moved, say, he was an impoverished, essentially homeless guy that died on the cross for us. I want to be like that guy. May I be one who serves at my own peril even though I don't have enough. Fact is, we have enough. Okay, one last passage. Cool thing about pulled pork is it's always done. That's why they stopped doing grilled chicken after church. I kept ruining the chicken. Romans 12. We're going to close with this. Romans 12, beginning in verse 1. I'm actually going to read verses 1 through 8 of Romans 12. We don't. This could be a whole sermon, obviously be a series of sermons, but we're going to read through it and just hit a couple of high points. The Apostle Paul in the argument of Romans is moving out of the glories of the gospel and the, and the work of Christ to redeem mankind. And he is now saying, since Jesus saves you and since he is in fact that awesome, I know it's not in your Bible, it's in the Greek, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy. Why? in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true, proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. He's saying, look at who God is. Look at what God has done. Do you believe him? Do you trust him? then don't be conformed to the world anymore. Don't be like them. Be like him. He's better. I mean, have you seen him? Do you trust him? Then don't conform yourself to this world anymore, but be transformed. Have your mind changed to be like Christ. This is like Boaz. He looked at the law and he said, I want to be like that. That's good. It's pleasing. Interestingly, 
his response, and he says, well, how do, how do we then act if we're going to worship by God by acknowledging what he has done and what he is like? His, the next five verses are all about service. He's saying, don't be like the world anymore who only serves when they have enough time or money. Now it's time to engage in service because Jesus is that awesome. For by the grace given me, this is verse 3 of Romans 12, I say to every one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Verse 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. We asked earlier, we didn't have any volunteers on that, so I guess we're missing that one. All right. If it is serving, then serve. What are you saying? What is he saying? He's been saying what we're saying right out of Ruth. If faith in God has moved you, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is encouraging, give encouragement. If it is giving, give generously. If it is to lead, do so diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. When we trust who God is and what God is like, and we say, thank you, God, for saving me from my sins, one who is not worthy of it, and God, I want to be like you. I want you to transform me to be like Jesus, I want to worship you with the moments of my life that I might be like Christ. Romans uh, 12 is telling us then we need to humble ourselves like Ruth and Boaz. To trust and to serve even though it puts us at risk. To trust and to serve even though none of the people God has put into our lives to serve deserve it. Wouldn't it be nice if God would finally put people in your life that were worthy of your service? Of course, I'm being facetious. You know it's true. You know you... Th oh, that guy is such a lazy bum. I don't want to go help him mow his yard. I mean, he's got two legs. That would just encourage his laziness. Humility. He starts with that. He says, I want you to serve people who don't deserve it. Because when Jesus came to serve us, if he would have only served the people who deserved it, who would he have served? None of us, because nobody deserved it. And he is calling us to be conformed to the image of Christ, not this world. Trust and serve, even, even when it imperils us. And in fact, we serve because it imperils us. The Bible tells us we belong to each other. We need each other. We're going to get to heaven. This will rattle your cage. That's what I do for a living. We're going to get to heaven, and we're going to discover there were things in your life that you couldn't get over in your Christian life because somebody else wasn't doing their job. When he says we need each other, he's not playing word games to encourage us to hang out. We're going to get to heaven, and one of the things that's going to cause sweat to drip down our necks is, remember, because we're so focused, so we're worried about the big video screen of our sins, right? Listen, we all know what we're doing, so that's not going to be that interesting. We have YouTube now. What's going to freak us out is we're going to see the video of somebody else's life, and God's going to say, I wanted to use you to help them with that. God's grace is going to be poured out in that moment, so you don't need to worry about walking into heaven with shame. There will be no shame. His grace will be poured out, and it will be more than we, are needed, than we need. But we need to understand in humility we need each other. We need one another. We cannot journey through this Christian life without the gifts that one another have. There are things in my life I will never be able to get over on my own. Pure and simple. There are things in your life you're praying for God to help you, and he is answering your prayer, and somebody is resisting his leading. Maybe we could be that church that stops resisting his leading and serve one another despite the fact that we don't deserve it. Why do we serve God and others? Why do we serve God with our time and with our money? Is it to be inspired? Is it to maintain connectivity and friendships in our community? Is it to learn more and be productive and be healthy? No. The reason we serve in trusting God, it is the primary way in this life that we get to do stuff the way Jesus does stuff. 
We serve one another with our time and money because it's the primary way that we get to do stuff the way Jesus does stuff. The only way you get to be like Jesus if you serve people who don't deserve it with stuff you don't have. In order to do that, we have to live life knowing that God is, in fact, enough, and he will, in fact, give enough. I've said it before. This is a profound theological truth. What's the worst thing that could happen to Christians? You die and go to heaven. According to the Apostle Paul, that's not a bad deal. In fact, he said it this way, I would prefer to go, but I will stay because God told me to. The primary way we serve is to, or I should say we serve because it's the primary way we have to do stuff that Jesus does. We live our life knowing God will give enough and that God himself is enough. I can serve you, you can serve me, we can serve each other at our peril. We can use time we don't have, we can use money that we don't know if tomorrow there will be enough, and we can do so to others and for others who do not deserve it. I told you service in the Bible is countercultural, isn't it? If the volunteer websites put this on their website, how many volunteers would they get? Yeah, that would be zero. But this is what God calls us to do. He says, has Christ moved in your heart that you can say he's enough? Has he moved in our hearts that we say, you know what? I can give up some of my leisure time and count that God will give me the rest that's needed. He will be my rest instead of my leisure. He will be my security instead of my bank account. Jesus serves. Why do we serve? Because we trust God and how? At our peril.